Welcome. In this session, we are going to start our discussion on oculoplasty and in the first three sessions, we will have anatomy of orbit, anatomy of eyelids and anatomy of the lacrimal apparatus. So starting with the anatomy of orbit in this session, the orbit is a funnel shaped cavity wider anteriorly and narrower posteriorly and the widest portion of the orbit lies 10 mm behind the anterior orbital margin. So the anterior orbital margin is not the widest portion of the orbit and the orbit is made up of portions of seven bones making up the four walls of the orbit. So the orbit does not have a posterior wall where it is conical from anterior to posterior and of course it doesn't have an anterior wall where the oculus surface lies. The medial walls of the two orbits are parallel to each other and the lateral walls of the two orbits are perpendicular to each other making each orbit funnel in shape. The seven bones contributing to the bony orbit include the frontal bone contributing to the roof of the orbit, the greater and lesser wings of the sphenoid contributing to the lateral wall, the roof and the medial wall of the orbit, the zygomatic bone contributing to the lateral wall and the floor of the orbit, the maxillary bone contributing to the floor and the medial wall of the orbit and the lacrimal and the ethmoid bones contributing to the medial wall of the orbit. The palatine bone also makes a small contribution to the floor of the orbit. Coming to the average dimensions of the orbit, the vertical height of the entrance of the orbit is 35 mm. The horizontal width of the orbital entrance is 45 mm. The anteroposterior length of the orbit is 45 mm. The volume of the orbit is 30 ml. And the posterior pole of the eyeball is 18 mm anterior to the orbital apex. Coming to the four orbital walls, the roof, the lateral wall, the floor and the medial wall. The roof is made up of two bones, the orbital plate of the frontal bone and the lesser wing of the sphenoid bone. The frontal sinus lies superior to the roof of the orbit and above which lie the anterior cranial fossa. The important features in the roof of the orbit include the fossa for the lacrimal gland superolaterally, fossa for the trochlea of the superior oblique muscle 5 mm behind the supranasal orbital margin, the supraorbital notch or foramen which allows the supraorbital nerve and vessels to pass through onto the forehead. The lateral wall is the thickest among the orbital walls made up of two bones, the greater wing of the sphenoid posteriorly and the orbital process of the zygomatic bone anteriorly. And the two lateral walls as we have mentioned are oriented at almost 45 degrees to the mid sagittal plane and almost perpendicular to each other. The lateral wall of the orbit is separated from the roof of the orbit by the superior orbital fissure. So the superior orbital fissure lies between the lateral wall and the roof of the orbit. And the lateral wall is separated from the floor of the orbit by the inferior orbital fissure. So the inferior orbital fissure separates the lateral wall from the floor of the orbit. Lateral to the lateral wall of the orbit lies the temporal fossa anteriorly and the middle cranial fossa posteriorly. The important features on the lateral orbital wall include the lateral orbital tubercle and the zygomaticotemporal and zygomaticofacial foramina. The lateral orbital tubercle is a very important structure to understand because it provides significant support to the contents of the orbit and it is also called the Whitnall's orbital tubercle. It lies approximately 10 mm below the frontozygomatic suture, providing attachment to the lateral retinaculum made up of the lateral canthal tendon, the lateral horn of the levator aponeurosis, the Lockwood's ligament and the check ligament of the lateral rectus muscle, which is not shown in this picture. In addition, Whitnall's ligament, which we will be describing shortly, although is primarily attached to the lateral orbital wall above the lateral canthal tendon, a few extensions of the Whitnall's ligament also gets attached to the lateral orbital tubercle. So the primary attachment of the Whitnall's ligament is not the Whitnall's lateral orbital tubercle but is above it. The floor is the shortest wall of the orbit made up of three bones. The maxillary bone contributing to the major portion of the floor of the orbit, the orbital plate of zygomatic bone anterolaterally and the palatine bone contributes to a very small portion posteriorly. The floor of the orbit is separated from the lateral wall of the orbit 
by the inferior orbital fissure and the maxillary sinus lies inferior to the floor of the orbit. The important anatomical features in the floor of the orbit are the infraorbital groove extending into the infraorbital canal and the nasolacrimal canal which lies at the junction of the floor and the medial walls of the orbit. The infraorbital groove and the canal allows the infraorbital nerve and the infraorbital artery to pass through and the orbital fluid is thinnest medial to the infraorbital groove and the canal and this is the most common site of blowout fractures of the orbit and thus blowout fractures of the orbit usually involve the infraorbital nerve. The infraorbital canal opens into the infraorbital foramen situated 10 mm below the central portion of the inferior orbital margin and it allows the infraorbital nerve to exit onto the cheek. The medial wall is the thinnest of the orbital walls and is thus prone to fracture and the medial wall is made up of four bones which from anterior to posterior are the frontal process of the maxillary bone, the lacrimal bone and the orbital plate of the ethmoid bone. The orbital plate of the ethmoid bone is also called the lamina papyrusi and is the major portion of the medial wall. The lesser wing of the sphenoid contributes to the posterior most portion of the medial wall of the orbit and forms the medial part of the optic canal. Medial to the medial wall of the orbit lies the ethmoid sinus anteriorly and the sphenoid sinus posteriorly and the nasal cavity lies medial to the ethmoid sinus. The important anatomical features in the medial wall of the orbit are the frontozygomatic suture, the anterior and posterior ethmoidal foramina and the lacrimal fossa. The frontoethmoidal suture lies at the level of the cribriform plate and the cribriform plate forms the base of the anterior cranial fossa and this is a very important landmark to remember. So, surgery of the medial wall of the orbit should be restricted below the frontoethmoidal suture else anterior cranial fossa can be entered. As a variation, the cribriform plate may be located below this level and with this variation, the anterior cranial fossa can be entered even if surgery of the medial orbital wall is restricted below the frontoethmoidal suture. Coming to the lacrimal fossa, the maxillary bone contributes to the anterior portion of the lacrimal fossa and the lacrimal bone contributes to the posterior portion of lacrimal fossa and in the lacrimal fossa lies the lacrimal sac of the lacrimal drainage apparatus. The anterior and the posterior ethmoidal foramina allow the anterior and posterior ethmoidal vessels and nerve to enter into the nasal cavity and infection, inflammation and neoplasm can pass either way between the orbit and the ethmoid sinus through these foramina or through the thin lamina papyrusi portion of the ethmoid bone. After discussing the walls of the orbit, we now come to the apertures in the walls of the orbit and first we have the annulus of Zin, also called the ocular motor foramen, which we have discussed in detail in the neuroophthalmology section. The annulus of Zin is located in the apex of the orbit and is made up of the origins of the recti muscle, the superior medial, inferior and lateral rectus muscle and is continuous with the dura of the optic nerve which passes through the annulus of Zin and the periorbita of the surrounding orbital bones. And the structures passing through the annulus of Zin inside the bony optic canal include the optic nerve, the ophthalmic artery and the sympathetic nerves associated with the ophthalmic artery and the structures passing through the annulus of Zin but outside the optic canal include the upper division and the lower division of the third cranial nerve, the nasociliary branch of the first division of the trigeminal nerve or the fifth cranial nerve and the sixth cranial nerve or the abducens nerve. So these structures pass through the superior orbital fissure but inside the annulus of Zin. The superior orbital fissure is located between the lateral wall and the roof of the orbit and the structures passing through the superior orbital fissure outside the annulus of Zin include the fourth cranial nerve, the only ocular motor nerve remaining outside the cone of the four recti muscles and thus can be spared in a retrobulbar block, the frontal branch of the ophthalmic division of the trigeminal nerve, the lacrimal branch of the ophthalmic division of the trigeminal nerve and the superior ophthalmic vein. The inferior orbital fissure is situated between the lateral wall and the floor of the orbit and the structures passing through the inferior orbital fissures 
at the zygomatic and the infraorbital nerves which are branches of the maxillary or second division of the trigeminal nerve not shown in this picture because they are not directly related to eye and the inferior ophthalmic vein. The other apertures in the orbit which we have already discussed but we will mention again are the supraorbital notch or foramen located in or above the superior orbital margin through which the supraorbital nerve and arteries exit onto the face, the infraorbital groove, the infraorbital canal and the infraorbital foramen which are actually continuous with each other, the infraorbital groove and infraorbital canal being located in the floor of the orbit and the infraorbital foramen lying 10 mm below the inferior orbital margin. Through the infraorbital groove and canal pass the infraorbital nerve and vessels which exit onto the face through the infraorbital foramen. The frontoethmoidal foramen is located in the frontoethmoidal suture of the medial wall and anterior and posterior ethmoidal arteries and nerves pass into the nasal cavity from the orbit through this foramen and these arteries are the major source of subperiosteal hematomas in orbital trauma. The nasolacrimal canal is located in the medial wall inferior to the lacrimal fossa and it transmits the nasolacrimal duct. The zygomaticofacial and zygomaticotemporal canals or foramina are located in the lateral wall. The zygomaticofacial nerves and vessels exit through the zygomaticofacial canal onto the cheek and the zygomaticotemporal nerves and vessels exit through the zygomaticotemporal canal onto the temporal fossa. The contents of the orbit include the eyeball, muscles, nerves, arteries and veins, connective tissue and lacrimal gland. We won't be discussing the course of muscles, nerves, arteries and veins. The course of nerves, arteries and veins having been already discussed in the section on neuroophthalmology and the course of the muscles will be discussed in the section on pediatric ophthalmology. The connective tissue of the orbit, particularly the septal system, is very important to understand because it supports the orbital contents inside the orbit and maintains special relationship between them. The periorbita is the periosteal lining of the orbital bones and posteriorly it is fused with the dura mater surrounding the optic nerve. Anteriorly it is continuous with the orbital septum and the periosteum of the facial aspect of the orbital bones. It is adherent to the orbital bones at the orbital margins as well as the apertures and tubercles on the walls of the orbit. Elsewhere it is loosely adherent to the bone and can be easily separated from the bone. The septal system consists of many fine septi throughout the orbit, oriented both radially and circumferentially and the septal system supports the orbital contents inside the orbit and maintains special relationship between the orbital contents particularly during ocular movements. The septal system has specialized portions called the Lockwood's ligament, the Whitnall's ligament, the intermuscular septum. The Lockwood's ligament and the Whitnall's ligament being mostly associated with the eyelids will be partly described here and more fully described in the next session on anatomy of the eyelids. In the anterior orbit, the septal system condenses to form specialized structures and they are the Whitnall's ligament superiorly the Lockwood's ligament inferiorly and the intermuscular septum between the rectus muscles. The Lockwood's inferior ligament arises from a condensation of the sheaths of the inferior rectus and the inferior oblique muscles. So the muscle sheaths of the inferior rectus and the inferior oblique join anterior to the inferior oblique muscle to form the Lockwood's ligament and the capsulopalpebral fascia of the lower lid and analog of the levator aponeurosis of the upper lid originates from the Lockwood's ligament and attaches to the inferior border of the inferior tarsus. The Whitnall superior suspensory ligament lies in the upper eyelid and it is a transverse thickening of the fascia of the levator palpebris superioris muscle where the muscle transforms from a muscle to an aponeurosis and this occurs 12 to 14 mm above the superior border of the upper tarsus. And this Whitnall's ligament is attached to the lateral and the medial orbital rim. Medially it is attached to the medial orbital wall near the trochlea of the superior oblique muscle and laterally it attaches to the lateral orbital rim above the lateral orbital tubercle.
Witness ligament is an important supporting structure and should not be damaged or transected during upper eyelid surgery. The intermuscular septum is also a part of the septal system in the anterior orbit and it connects each rectus muscle to its adjacent rectus muscles and it divides the orbit into an intraconal and an extraconal space. The intraconal space lie within the cone of the rectus muscles and their associated intermuscular septum and the cone is formed by the posterior origin of the rectus muscles at the animus of zinc and their insertion anteriorly on the sclera of the eyeball. The extraconal space lie outside the cone of the rectus muscles and their associated intermuscular septum and is important when considering a surgical approach based on orbital imaging. In the mid orbit behind the anterior orbit, the septal system forms fascial slings and suspensory structures for each of the extraocular muscles and the septal system is supported by the connective tissue lining the inner surface of the periorbiter. At the orbital margin, the periorbiter separates from this connective tissue lining and continues as the periosteum of the facial aspects of the orbital bones and the connective tissue lining continue into the eyelids as the orbital septum. Damage and fibrosis of the septal system can lead to globe displacement and or muscle restriction. The tenons capsule is a dense elastic and vascular connective tissue enclosing the globe except the cornea and it extends anteriorly up to the perilimbal sclera and extends posteriorly up to the optic nerve where it fuses with the dura and the sclera. The recti muscles penetrate the tenon capsule before reaching the globe and each of them is invested by a sleeve-like forward extension of the tenon capsule up to the insertion of the muscle. Lobules of fat surrounded by connective tissue fascia fills the intervening spaces between the orbital structures. Here we will briefly describe lacrimal gland and discuss it in more details in the session on anatomy of the lacrimal apparatus. The lacrimal gland is located in the lacrimal fossa of the frontal bone and it consists of an upper orbital loop which is larger and a lower palpebral loop which is smaller and the orbital and the palpebral lobe are separated by an indentation created by the lateral horn of the levator aponeurosis and ducts from both the lobes the orbital and the palpebral pass through the lower palpebral lobe and then drain into the upper conjunctival fornix so biopsy is not done from the palpebral lobe or the suprotemporal fornix and is taken only from the orbital lobe of the lacrimal gland thank you for listening